Okay, good morning. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for having me here and it's such a great venue and it's, um, it's a real honour to be invited to, to speak here. And um, thank you very much for, for all attending as it'd be uh, pretty awkward if I was doing this to an empty room. So, um, so as Gabby mentioned, I'm a graphic designer. Um, I run a design consultancy in Melbourne. Um, called Hunt & Co. Little address there if you want to check it out. Uh, this is my business card, one of. Um, and I'm also a publisher. Um, I run a publishing company called Made Publishers. Um, and we publish uh, Process Journal and Made Quarterly. Um, and we've got another one on the way as well. I said that like I'm expecting a child. <laughs> Um, and I'm also the, the proud father of a 10-year-old Pomeranian, um, and this is Baz. <laughs> in, in every presentation I do, I always make sure I get her picture up on the screen, and I know she'd love it as well. <laughs> um, so today I'm talking about the topic of minimalism. Uh, minimalism is defined as the concept of minimising distractions from what's truly valuable or essential. Uh, opposite for the graphic designers in the audience would be David Carson. Um, so why am I here and what does minimal minimalism mean to me? Um, I guess rather than stand up and give you a lecture on kind of, well not give you a lecture, but talk about kind of minimalism in the grander scheme in the historical sense, um, I'd talk to you more about my um, kind of personal uh, interpretation of what minimal minimalism is. Far out, I've got to start saying that properly considering that's the topic. Um, so what does minimal minimalism mean to me? Um, and I guess that was when I was when first asked to do this and, and given the topic, um, I guess I was a, a little bit surprised as I, I don't really, I've never consciously thought of myself as a minimalist or um, I guess someone who practices minimalism and to be honest it was, it was quite I guess a daunting task and it, it was something that caused me to um, I guess re reflect a little bit um, on perhaps why I was asked here to, to speak in the first place. So my first reaction was, I'm not a minimalist. Um, and I kind of felt like the, the title of a minimalist is kind of this grand kind of title that I, I, I don't know, that I didn't feel kind of almost worthy, uh, I guess, to go down in the history books as a minimalist. Um, so on further investigation and kind of doing a little bit of research on, on minimalism and um, I guess understanding how that relates to me, I came across the term a uh, reductivist, um, which is really cool. And I was much more comfortable with that. I felt, I felt that, yeah, that, that, that's kind of, that's a, that's a big part of what I do. It's about kind of reducing things down and uh, communicating more clearly. And in my opinion, it's a way cooler word than uh, a minimalist as well. So I was pretty comfortable with that. And I thought, yep, great. I'm going to take this presentation as I'm a reductivist, not a minimalist. I also think that would make an excellent next business card title. But then I did a little more research and came across the definition. Uh, one who follows the methods of reductivism, a minimalist. So <laughs> I'm kind of back at, uh, back at square one. So my next, my next kind of point of call was to think, okay, um, I guess there's, you know, there's endless amounts of research I can do on why or why not I might be a minimalist, but I thought it was great to get it from um, some other people and some outside perspective. 
And this, is, this, this was actually quite a bizarre experience because um, it's, it's not very often you, you, you ask people that you work with and people that you know and go, hey, what, what, what do you think of me? And you get a, and I got quite a, a comprehensive response from all of the people I asked. And it, it was humbling, but also very bizarre as well. Um, as my experience has always been, you'll hear from people when you're doing something wrong, but it'll be but nothing when you're doing something right. So the first person I asked was Gabby, um, who was just up here a moment ago. And she said, a lot of your projects are great ideas condensed into something seemingly so simple, which was, I, I, I guess, really nice. And it's, it's, it's something that I've never kind of actively considered about myself or my work. Um, but it was very humbling to kind of know that that's, that's how others are perhaps perceiving what I do. One of the other people I asked was, generally, it was Chris Doyle. Um, I don't know. I think he's in the crowd, maybe, somewhere. No. Yep, there he is. Um, generally speaking, your work is graphically minimal and rarely gratuitous or excessive, um, which I thought was, was really nice as well. The third person was, is outside of uh, kind of my regular realm of work and whilst one of my biggest supporters, um, so he, he's not kind of, I guess, I, I don't obviously work with him. Um, so I asked my dad, uh, why am I a minimalist? And he said, what's minimalism? <laughs> and when, when I asked him that, he, um, I kind of, I kind of, I laughed, like, straight back at him, and I felt really bad. And he turns around and he's like, what's so funny? And I said, you've, you've just given me, like, the punchline for my presentation, so I'm pretty happy with that. And he's like, oh, okay, not, not kind of getting it. But then, and I, and I felt a bit, a little bit bad including it, but then, the following day I was sitting at my desk and on his drive into work I got a call from him saying, so I've been thinking about minimalism and I'd like to have a chat to you about it. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure he'd been on Google that night, um, Googling the shit out of minimalism. Um, and then he's like, oh, I heard something on the radio on the drive in and I was kind of running off to a meeting and I'm trying to hang up and he's kind of, and He's wanting to have this kind of deep conversation about what's minimalism mean to me? And I'm like, Dad, I've got to go. And he's like, I think I'm a minimalist. I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> but bless him, his intentions were, he was, he was really trying to show an interest in what I was doing. And uh, that's always very welcomed. Um, so where to from here? Um, I thought I'd talk about, uh, I guess, more specifically what minimalism means to me, um, both in my personal life um, and also my professional life, and in turn how that influences my work as well. Uh, so firstly, I, I thought I'd talk about a couple of points that I guess on, it's, it's, as, as I mentioned, it's very difficult to kind of self-critique and it was, it was really hard to kind of get these kind of things and I guess uncover them and I went on a bit of a, a personal journey to, uh, to kind of get to this point. Uh, observation, I own at least 40 black t-shirts. Um, today is a fancy event so I'm wearing a shirt but um, usually most people that know me I wear pretty much only black t-shirts and that's not something I do by default but when I was kind of looking around the house for things that are minimal about me. Um, I couldn't ignore the 40 t-shirts just lined up in my closet. Um, I own very little furniture, so this wasn't something that was apparent to me until, um, so we moved into our house about five or six years ago and our neighbour came over and for the first time about a year in, which was a bit weird, um, and she's an older lady and she's kind of looking around our house and I'm like going, what is she looking for? Like she's like totally scoping this place out. And then she, then she said, oh, you moved in like a year ago, yeah? And I'm like, yeah, why? She's like, where's all of your furniture? And yeah, apparently I don't own a lot of furniture, so yeah. Um, and my last one, the amount of time I spend at the gym, but <laughs> it's pretty minimal. I. I <laughs> I want to go and, uh, you know, I like going, but it just, it just doesn't happen. 
and you can't really tell, can you? <laughs> um, so inspiration that is in graphic design. One of the um, one of the questions I guess uh, a lot of people ask me, and, and when I get emails from people or students and that kind of thing, nine out of ten times the the number one question is what inspires you. So. I thought I'd tackle that one head on um, and perhaps could refer these people to this presentation afterwards. Um, but what, what was interesting, um, I guess obviously producing Process Journal, I look at a lot of graphic design um, and a lot of other designers work and that's definitely inspiring but I find looking at it kind of over and over and, and, and being a graphic designer all day, um, it kind of I, I kind of feel like at the end of the day you, you want a break, um, almost like you want to stop looking at the screen and you know, don't, don't feel like going and watching TV. It's kind of like picking up a book at the end of the day for me is kind of, I guess, that's, that's a very vague, weird kind of way of putting it. But um, yeah, the inspiration that's not graphic design, I think for me, is more important than what does inspire in, in terms of what inspires me. Um, so the first one is James Terrell. Does, do many people know who he is? And anyone? Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> um, so James Terrell, I embarrassingly didn't really know uh, much of his work until um, I went and saw an exhibition of his at LACMA in Los Angeles um, about, about 12 months ago now. This is him, he's got a great beard. Um, Really, really incredibly interesting guy. So, James Terrell, um, he's, I, I guess you're describing it, him as a visual artist, um, but all of his works revolve around uh, playing with light and the perception of light. So, he does a lot of, so he does installations and kind of exhibition pieces, um, and this is one of them, um, but also, in architecture and, and buildings and that kind of thing. So this one's, I guess, what he does is quite abstract and quite difficult to explain, but it's also extremely kind of minimal. So this is one of the ones they did have set up at the exhibition. And basically it's these stairs you walk up to and you enter this room, uh, which is the person at the top there. And when you're inside, that's kind of what it looks like. And it's lit in a way that uh, all of the light changes um, different colours, but as you look back out, it's a white wall, but your perception of the light outside um, changes colour and it goes through blues, oranges, and um, yeah, re really incredible stuff. And I'm, I highly recommend um, kind of looking up some of his work as well. He's just re released a, a book um, that's part of the exhibition as well, which is a, I think, a a really good one to have a look at. Um, this is another one, so his work is so beautifully simple um, and this is just kind of a square projection in the corner of the room and there's another one that's kind of like projects a 3D cube and it's really beautiful and really simple but I find this incredibly inspiring that it is, there's such a great level of refinement and kind of concept to it but it's not, um, but it's also so simple. Oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Um, so this is a, another one of his pieces that um, out in the desert in the middle of Arizona, he has this installation. It's in a, a dormant uh, volcano and it's a series of these kind of architectural pods and they're kind of linked. And um, when you go in there, I haven't been in there personally, um, when you go in there, um, you look through these tunnels and they're connected and there's light and it's kind of the perception of it's great and it was actually sponsored and built I think by the, the Guggenheim um, and he's been building this I think over the last kind of 15 years or so which is absolutely incredible and for someone to be able to take their their kind of art form to this scale is um, for me just amazing. Um, Oki Sato who's um, he's the designer of, of Nendo uh, Japanese furniture um, company and this is and we we interviewed him as part of um, as part of Made uh, Edition One, and he gave us a really good interview and beautiful products. I'm sure some of them will be familiar. Um, and on another note, that is the coolest profile picture. I don't. It's a lamp with sand coming out. I don't. I don't understand it, but I really like it. And 
I, I think that's great. It's it's incredible when you Google people for pictures, what comes up. These kind of like crazy abstract ones, and he's got the thick scarf and very very cool. Um, so I'll be a bit quicker on, on these ones, but these are these are the farming net lamps that uh, Nendo did. They're they're made of kind of black black mesh and a bit of a close up detail. Um, I think what really inspires me about this work is it is obviously very minimal, but it's it's all about the form um, and the shape and the material, but with a very restrained selection of material as well. And I, I find these kind of compositions, even the way they present the products, um, they're kind of their compositions and their their layouts in themselves, and um, really beautiful. And this is kind of a, a desk lamp concept as well. Um, and this is a little bit of packaging. This kind of is a bit of an oddball in terms of their work, but um, I still really, really love it as well. Um, and the other person is Oliver Reichenstein. I, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, he's maybe better known as the, the guy that does... Um, that was the best profile picture of him I could find, which is pretty cool. Um, he, you may be familiar with his product, Writer, um, and his company... Um, information architects. So this one I guess is kind of what, what, where this is an inspiration for me um, is we, we do quite a bit of web and, and digital work as well but for someone to, to reinvent something um, as simple as the word processor is um, you know a really incredible feat and the, the typography is spot on and it's beautiful and I'm sure some of you have, have used it and um, are familiar with it as well but um, I, f I find that the, f the fact that someone can go away um, and remake a product that already exists but remake it better with the focus on the, <laughs> on the user um, is incredible and I find this a, a great tool and both on iPad and on the, the Mac as well. Um, it does come on iPhone but I, I find that a little bit frustrating to type on the iPhone but this is also a really beautiful example of um, kind of responsive design so it's the same platform but it's adapted to different platforms and whilst that seems quite simple um, it's actually an incredibly complicated task and I, I find what they've done with this is is really kind of contributing to a, a better world. Um, so I thought I'd talk a bit more about uh, what minimalism means to me in a professional sense um, and in turn my work as well. Observation, I can't decide on a desktop background. Um, that's my desktop there, <laughs> which is pretty, when I look at it like that, that's pretty grim and pretty stark, but I just, I, t I, I set a wallpaper and it lasts about 10 minutes and it gives me the shits and yeah, so anyway, that's... Uh, kind of what I look at every day. Uh, observation, I don't work well with colour and I hate that orange. So there is orange in this presentation but I felt obliged to put some colour in but um, I didn't like it. Um, observation, I'm typographically monogamous. Um, I tend to, when I get onto a typeface, um, I tend to stick with it and I think a really good example of that is perhaps process journal, that that's, uh, each edition of that has been consistently set um, in one typeface and for those wondering it's currently Calibre. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about my work as well um, and I've pulled out a couple of projects. I guess these, um, I've tried to pick projects that are not, um, I guess not necessarily what I do kind of all the time and every day. Um, so I've really kind of scoured for my most minimal work uh, so Cross Section Studio, so this is a project I did nearly seven years ago now um, and it's one that I guess uh, it was actually the first project I ever did um, as part of my studio and it was my first job um, and I'd left a full time job and this is kind of what I had. Um, so it was for a small local um, architect. Um, the identity is kind of really very simple and it uses back in the day when I was uh, monogamous with Helvetica. Um, it uses just Helvetica black and white and it was done um, it was done on a really tight budget. I think I think I got five hundred dollars for the work. Um, which at the time I was like, five hundred dollars, yeah. <laughs> um, but 
it, it was it was an interesting job and kind of there's not a lot to it other than this giant cross that became kind of the symbol and it worked really well in the studio and there was some graphics on the door and that kind of thing with it as well and there wasn't a lot to it but um, surprisingly I've, ne I've never had a project that's been kind of blogged and uh, featured more than this one which is which is kind of weird and I look at it now and see all of the flaws and go oh, yuck but um, being my first job it's always got a bit of a, a special place to me as well. Um, my favourite one was this, uh, was the CD, back, back when people used CDs. Um, and that's kind of the station. We, we, we did a notepad, uh, a letterhead, a CD, a business card, and that was kind of it. And it was printed um, just one colour, uh, straight up black. Uh, Missouri Architects, so Missouri, this is a job that we did uh, kind of more recently, and I guess this is one we haven't it's not only our website or anything like that so I guess unless you've seen me present this somewhere else um, for the most part it's it's not really out there um, so Missouri in Japanese means threefold and the idea of this identity was um, through a single or th through three folds to create this um, kind of diagonal line and, and create create a shape. So it started with the letterhead and we did a fold down um, and with just three folds it gave this angle and then through that we we bought the finished kind of fold into the letterhead, uh, the, sorry the, the business cards, the with comps um, and we scored this fold in it and it was actually really nice because in turn it made this um, kind of architectural little piece so the business card could stand up by itself um, and when you go to their office they're kind of all over the place and everywhere um, and in terms of the production of the job though what I really like about it is it's so simple it's just a grey coloured stock uh, key colour um, and then it just has a, an indigo white print on it so there's, there's not a lot to it but um, we were really happy with the outcome um, and that's with the with comps and that's with them, them standing up there as well but they also arrived um, flat like this and as you can see the the scores in there as well and it's also only uses one typeface um, and then with that further we worked with them to incorporate it into their office so their office has all it's kind of wood panelling um, and this is a pretty severe crop but um, they continued that line throughout the office and the the logo type was also kind of etched into the wood which was a, a really nice nice application um, so I thought I'd talk about another project that's more recent and you may or may not have seen it, I'm hoping you've seen it, um, <laughs> is the website for May Publishers, our publishing company. So we've recently just relaunched this, um, originally we had Process Journal and May Quarterly under the, under kind of separate entities but we've recently, uh, with our other publication in development, um, combined them into a, a single entity um, and the result of that is May Publishers. So. Um, this is just kind of a, a bit of a, some of the recent publications we've, we've included. It doesn't really, it's not really that relevant to what I'm talking about here, but I uh, wanted to get it in there. So um, this is our new website we launched, and this, we launched this one about a month ago, um, and it's something I'm really proud of, and um, it was quite a process to actually get to, to this point with this website, and I think this was version number 16 or something. It was almost like a, a hobby for me to be redesigning this website. But going through that process was really interesting. And a lot of it was about, well, our aim for the website was to make something that um, was kind of not, not as minimal as possible, but as functional as possible. So the only thing that is on the site is, is exactly what needs to be there and kind of nothing else. Um, there was also a lot of thought given to um, people using mobile devices and I think about 45, nearly 50% of the people who visit this site do so on a, on a tablet or a, or a phone as well. So the mobile component of the site was really important as well. Um, and that, I guess, a lot of decisions on this site were driven by um, functions. So things like... Um, there's no kind of hover overlays over the images so that you have to double tap. You can always single tap everywhere through the website so you're not kind of hindered by the, the desktop experience as well. So 
on the left hand side is the kind of full blown desktop version and then on the um, on the right hand side is the condensed mobile version but there's actually um, there's actually uh, three more steps in between those as well um, if you grab the corner of the browser window and kind of drag it you'll see it reorganize and, and how it all works um, I also thought I'd make a special mention to Zan St. Pierre who is the developer of this site um, he's a fantastic guy and did a wonderful job and uh, I promised him I'd give him a shout out um, so this is also this this component here this page is um, is the online store component and a lot of thought went into that um, in terms of kind of usability and things we noticed on the other site so this one as you can see when in full view you get the landscape version which brings that to cart button up higher it puts the description alongside the images so you don't have to scroll to see the content um, and then of course the mobile version um, brings it in line and stacks it but reduces the size of the image so you're not kind of the, the experience for the user isn't compromised um, at all as well. One of the other little details that I was really happy with was the logo in the top left hand corner. So we've got it in two configurations but as you scale down or scroll down uh, it jumps to the landscape uh, version to bring the content higher up as well. Um, this is another example of how they, they work with the um, the grid um, concept so this is like a, a three column grid that's in modules and how that stacks as well um, and then also the, the implications for things like the online store when selecting product um, and you can see in the, the right hand side as well the navigation uh, shifts to a, a kind of a stacked view um, as well um, so one of the other things that uh, is really important, I guess, in the, this process was making a better checkout process. Um, I'm continually kind of frustrated by poorly designed checkout processes that take time and are boring and, um, you know, kind of lose people along the way. So the idea was with this, um, designing, as a designer, designing checkout pages, I believe, is one of the most tedious things you could ever do. Um, but we really kind of spent a lot of time on this and made sure we got it right. So. Once you added a product to the cart, you just put in your email address and then we've got this three columns. So basically it's, it's your shipping address, billing details, you fill out one, the second populates, you make your payment and hit the button and that's kind of it. So it's kind of this two step, um, but essentially a one page checkout and we've had really, really good results with that. Um, and then we've done it in a way that it stacks and becomes really easy for, for people on mobile as well. And I guess this, this one's a, something without kind of bogging down and becoming too technical and boring about it. Um, I guess just back to kind of Gabby's content, this is, this is something that seems kind of in the finished product and I look at it now and you know after however many design revisions, why would you think, why didn't I do that in the first place? But once there's a lot of work that's gone into this and I think when the outcome can be so simple um, and you can think that that's that's for me a, a real real success um, so the last one I'll talk about is, is process journal so our publication uh, hopefully you're all subscribers and readers here I presu I'll presume you are <laughs> but um, it's a um, it's a publication about graphic design um, and it's been a, 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 a a project that's been kind of very dear to me um, and it's kind of I, gu I guess a, a, a product of my love for kind of publication design and graphic design as well um, and looking back I think pro process journal is a unique kind of brief and proposition in the sense that it's a project that's about graphic design for graphic designers um, by a graphic designer which is a bit of a, an odd combination because I believe I, I guess graphic other graphic designers are going to be the biggest um, critics of, of this work and and also ensuring that we're presenting it in a way um, that I guess um, supports and presents the work in the publication uh, fairly and kind of that doesn't, in a way that doesn't conflict with the design of the publication, uh, presents a number of challenges in itself. But I've included a couple of uh, couple of images here of some of my favourite spreads that we've done uh, over the years. So we're, we're, we've currently done ten editions, and we're working on uh, number eleven at the moment. 
So this is where it all started um, with edition one, and I guess it's the cover's black and white. You can't really see it, but the cover is uh, covered in like a full blind emboss. Um, and looking back at it, it is quite minimal. Um, this is a, a wrap we did. It was like a limited edition poster that wrapped around edition two that was um, one of my favourites as well. And a uh, single colour print on a black stock. Um, and this, this wasn't, this was more dictated by the, the function as well. We, we only just kind of starting out. We didn't really have the budget to do anything. So what we did decide on was a, a single colour print, but it's, it's been one of my long standing favourites as well. And just a close up detail of it as well. It was printed in a, uh, it was a black stock with a, a 877, which is a, a metallic silver PMS. Um, this is another one from this edition. Edition 2 has probably been my favourite so far and um, it's a really beautiful kind of overprint uh, type specimen as well. That's actually another really daunting task, designing type specimens that you know are going to be viewed and critiqued by um, type designers as well. Um, this is one of my favourite projects that we've featured as well. It was a, uh, the, an identity for the uh, Bauhaus Museum. Um, and then just kind of a, another feature that we did on Aesop that for some reason that layout's incredibly simple but it's always really appealed to me. Um, and these are a couple from edition 7. I've tried to pick ones that I guess haven't been, I haven't kind of recently publicised and been, been out there. And this is another one by uh, Maid Thought in edition 7. Uh, and then more recently edition 10 which is the current one. Um, and this one, this one, I was really happy with the outcome as well. Uh, and every four editions, we kind of give it a design overhaul, and it's a bit of a, a vessel for us to experiment and play with without, I guess, any sort of client restrictions as well. Um, but this one, it usually takes one or two, to, or two or three sometimes, to kind of find your rhythm with a new design. And I feel like this one was, um, you know, it, it, it's been one of my, my prouder ones along the way as well. Um, and a couple of spreads. So there's a profile on 2x4 and um, they do really, really beautiful work. So this one's based on, on New York and New York Studios. Um, and to bring you back, this they designed the James Terrell book I was telling you about earlier. So it was really nice to get that in there and, uh, and feature some of his work kind of secondhand. Um, and as I talked about the, the type specimens, this is one we did for, for commercial type that I was kind of particularly pleased with, but um, you know, really beautiful typefaces make our job a lot easier. So before we finish, <coughs> a shameless plug, if you'd like to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, I'll give you all a moment to get your phones out. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just made publishers for, for both of them. and. Uh, that's me. Thank you very much for having me.